so why don't we just do some introductions, then we'll kind of bring up the slides afterwards. But uh, Nina, would you want to go first for us? Hi, uh, so I'm, I'm Nina Delgadillo, and I'm so happy to be here today. I'm a retired ATF agent. Uh, that's the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Farms, and Explosives. There for 25 years and had a, a great career with as an investigator, but of other responsibilities and endeavors, including a, an instructor at the National Academy for most of my career. So worked with congressional and media affairs and crisis communication. From there, I went into the education world and um, led a large team at a metropolitan school district, about 77 school sites. And we had some great successes and, and frankly, some failures too. And so those, those are some of the things we'll talk about today and how we learn from them. And then I went into risk management and now I've landed for the last almost year, DPRAP, and I'm so happy to be able to engage and empower folks like you and get to share ideas and learn from you as well. I'm glad to be here. Good to have you. Dave, <laughs> who are you? Yeah, <laughs> sometimes <laughs> I wake up and ask myself that, but <laughs> I'll condense it into about a minute. Uh, my name is Dave Danino. I did work at a state university here in Connecticut for about 37, 38 years as a director of counseling. I also taught in the clinical mental health program for a long period of time. I continue to do that. Uh, but my connection uh, to today's seminar really is my connection to BIT and care teams, higher education, uh, dealing with how to build BIT teams, how to maintain them, and how to keep them going. It was foundational in that <clears throat> I helped uh, build the one that was at Southern a lot of years ago. So, and also with DPrep, uh, I have a background in emergency response as well. You heard me mention not going to California, but I've been doing emergency response work since the Twin Towers went down as a uh, in New York as a as a disaster mental health uh, provider on scene uh, for shootings, uh, floods, bombings, whatever the need might be. So I've been there, and a lot of what we're talking about today is about how you manage well how you go back and remanage well and how you go back and remanage well yet again. So it's nice to be with you all today. Absolutely. I also see Karen on the call today. I'm sorry, I'll embarrass you out, Karen, but another one of our consultants who does work in resiliency and support for first responders and many other things as well. Um, Karen, if you wanted to say hi, we'd love to hear from you. Hey, everybody. I'm so glad that you were able to make it out to this meeting today to discuss some really important things. If you've watched the news lately, you know exactly why we're here. So um, I'm just honored to be a part of this fine group of people and welcome to the new faces. And I see some, some faces I've seen before. So here's to a great training. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So let's pull up some slides and we'll kind of jump in here and get started. So this is part of our, our Pathways Care Team series. And um, we were offering these as free trainings once a month. We do this with uh, Bit and Care as well as with uh, Dark Fox. So we have a lot of great uh, information and solid uh, trainings for you that are coming up. We'd encourage you to look at those as we go. You see David, Nina, and I here listed. And I'm happy to share some of these concepts with you. As I mentioned, this topic is a little more, I want to say, advanced than some of the other topics that we've talked through. So I want to just, um, I think, be aware of that. So if you're kind of new to this topic, I wanted to make sure that you were comfortable with um, knowing that we're going to talk about a slightly more advanced topic. But as always, we'll try to bring it back um, to some uh, basics and uh, understanding as we go. So this program really is based on some important concepts that we have borrowed from read in, in these three books. One is the logic of failure, the other black box thinking and, and mindset. Part of this, I think, is uh, as we go through programs and discuss things, the, the idea of continual learning and training is just so important. So um, these are books that I'd, I'd suggest having on your bookshelf as a plan to read. I'd probably say black box thinking is one of the more accessible ones. Uh, the Logic of Failure is great. Um, it does have a slightly deeper dive in some of the content. So um, a good book, but probably one that's a little deeper on this. So we'll borrow from all three of these concepts and, and jump through. Let me talk through the, the basic concepts of the first text here. When we think about BIT and CARE teams, one of the things that we need to appreciate is these are complex systems that don't always have an immediate consequence to difficult or off. So essentially, if someone violates a rule that we all would agree is a best practice for the bit, there often is not an immediate ill effect to that. And I think about uh, bicycle helmets as a really good practical example of, around this. And for my EMT and doctor and medical friends on the call, let me say really clearly, people should wear helmets. That's super smart. <laughs> However, 
the issue with helmets is it's an intermediate occasional it's a catastrophic problem that happens but most people are not going to have a immediate thank goodness i fell and there's this big dent in my helmet and this saved my life experience it's something that they're not getting a lot of feedback around. And in fact, we also have a situation where they might have positive feedback for not following the rules. And this is a funny way to think about it, but not having to deal with putting a helmet on, having your hair blowing free in the breeze is kind of a reinforcement strategy for this bad choice. And what the logic of failure puts out there, I think, is there's been several major problems that we've seen, major catastrophes that are not the result of one small issue, but really a larger way of a lack of reflective thinking in this space. The Challenger space shuttle explosion, the Chernobyl events are two examples that they're given in the book of catastrophic failure that occurred not because of a singular issue, but because, and I use this term cautiously, kind of a failure of management, a failure to the look down the road and around the corner. A failure to appreciate that in complex systems, we need to be paying attention to all of these things coming together. Um, when I think about this too, as a family therapist and a couples counselor, I think there's some great work in this in cybernetic theory around uh, the identified patient. If you're a counselor and clinician, you've heard this phrase before. It, it's never just that one person who's the problem, right? It's often the family system. And a good family therapist is one that can look at the totality of that. Before I talk about an example in a bit, I, I wanna kind of pass to Nina and Dave, whoever would like to go first, and maybe just talk about you know your understanding of other complex systems where there maybe was a failure or an issue that occurred, you know, maybe the Red Cross, maybe a bitter care team, a counseling center through the ATF, uh, law enforcement, where you know this idea of a complex system, because someone wasn't looking at the, the larger issues, we saw some failure that occurred. I don't know if anything comes to either of your minds. So, so you know, this happens in in every um, every occupation, every professional group, where we have a tendency to say, okay, we're we're good at what we do, we continually train. But the reality is, we learn every time we go out and do things, right? So you can have epic failures in your organization, and it's really about learning from them and moving forward and making sure that they don't happen again, and and and, and helping others understand that failures are what makes you better. It, it it's it's not always that it makes you better, but you can certainly learn from them. And that's why we do these after action reports. That's why after every shooting, there's an after action report that's really delved into to see what are steps we could have taken to mitigate this risk better. So I know that's a little off topic as far as you know law enforcement, but I just want you to know that in every part of life, um, it's applicable. And, and that's why even moving on uh, exercises, when you do, these mass casualty exercises with uh, folks from mental health and from first responders and from life flight. It's important that all of those people are at the table to experience this together because we have the opportunity to make mistakes in those scenarios too, to translate to later in, in, in actual events. And Dave can speak a lot to that. Yeah, I'll, I'm going to echo a lot of what Nina said, but you know, I, I think you said something earlier, Brian, that dovetails very nicely. And that is that you wear your bicycle helmet or your motorcycle helmet every day because you don't know when the, the day uh, is going to come when you really need to have it on. So you have to uh, you have a team approach where everybody has it on all the time and, and it doesn't waver. Uh, but certainly kind of in a, a, a nutshell, you know, complex teams need follow-up, they need review. And my take on that would be, and I think Karen would know this as a responder and other responders that are on the, uh, on the call today. We think daily in terms of what's immediately at hand, what needs to be fixed, one. Number two, needs to be fixed longer term, longer term meaning next day or next week or next month. All of that is characterized when we have issues in participating as a team and many different people coming to the table. And I can tell you, BITS do that, care teams do that. There's lots of different orientations, if you will. The Red Cross does it with different people coming from different agencies. We have uh, that end of the day meeting, which Nina described, uh, we affectionately call it a hot wash. But after the exercise, we have to go through everything and say, what can we do better next time? What did we miss? Not purposely, um, but what did we miss and how can we regroup from that? And I think that when you apply that to team structure, particularly with bit and care teams or monitoring teams, if you're applying that weekly or quarterly and you're reviewing things, you're gonna be in much better shape because you're bringing six, seven people into a room anytime you meet, 
with six different ideas about what should be done. And that has to be corralled and monitored and done correctly for whatever it is that your work impacts. I like the idea too, that this is an organized process. I think that's a great place to, to have it occur as well. I think um, we don't want to have a situation that erupts into chaos. You know, how do we define chaos in the law enforcement space? Do you know that one? <laughs> there's, there's a lot of different ways. <laughs> Oh, I've, I've, I've heard the uh, the chief has arrived on scene is the one I heard. <laughs> but, but I appreciate you not saying that, letting me get to the outside. <laughs> um, yeah, so to kind of conclude this first like little bit here around this, um, you know, can you all see this okay? The uh, complex, not transparent, perfect. The, the systems, and I think this is a good list for you all to write down from the book that you know part of the challenge here to overcome is that we're dealing with complex issues they're not transparent. And by not transparent, they, they only really up, uh, appear when we go looking for them. Like that's the issue that we run into here. Uh, why a hot wash or an after action report or an M&M, &M, uh, not the candy or the wrapper, but a mortality and morbidity in the, in the health space. This is why we do these things because they only show themselves uh, upon application. I feel like there's some good black light or bioluminescence example here that I could use as well, but we have to go looking for it because they're not transparent. There's internal dynamics on the team. And I, I use Newton's cradle there to demonstrate that it's kind of like whack-a-mole, right? You fix one problem, you create another. And that's something that you should be thoughtful about. And it's very few people, it's available to everyone, but it requires a reflective manager to look at this because there's a lack of understanding of why problems exist. I, I consult with schools frequently who have um, either not taken anonymous reports in their advertising or in a space where they um, use like a Maxient form or another company's form and they require people to enter like their ID to make a report. And I, I see on one level why that makes sense and make things easier in terms of reporting. On the flip side, when I give an example, what would it be like, you know, Nina, if we asked everyone to enter their ID and name when they called 911? Like it, it would have a reductionary effect on people making that use. If we pulled a fire extinguisher and the only way you could pull, you shouldn't really pull a fire extinguisher, a fire pull, if you pull the fire pull, um, but only the people that were like community members or faculty and staff were allowed to pull the, pull the fire pull. We, we would have a problem there that we want anyone within the system to be able to make a report. We don't want to make it more difficult or create obstacles. The, so the example I had, and I thought the ones given were already were great, but you know, back to bit care reports that they gave you a couple there. When we restrict access, when we make the form long and it takes 15 minutes to fill out, I understand on one hand, we're getting better information and that's great. On the other hand, what people are you missing halfway through that form who are like, never mind, I'm not <laughs> giving the name of my firstborn son and my blood type, you know what I'm talking about. Also, forms can be overly technical. I've watched forms be very law enforcement heavy. Heavy. What's the incident that's occurred? I've seen one recently where it says, as you're writing these things out, just a heads up, if you take more than 10 minutes to do the form, it resets. <laughs> so someone here is like typing a narrative and the form reset. And I love, we'll get to this near the end, I love that they spent the time doing something like, well, we should put a note on the form that says, hey, make sure you know it resets after 10 minutes. That's a good heads up. It's a step in the right direction. It doesn't go far enough. You need to have a way to um, help people really solve that problem. It's nice to give them the heads up that they're in a time crunch to share information with you. But I mean, I, I, again, I think in a 911 setting, do you want to say, I have two minutes to talk to you, make sure you tell me everything you need to know in these two minutes, otherwise I'm going to hang up on you. And that's not a good process. So we got to look at ways to fix that. And that's really that after action or an external review that can help. Uh, this is just a quick slide that talks about when you are building a capacity for your team. Um, we often give the example of knowing your sort of high water mark for referrals. Like I've watched some teams say, well, we'll take referrals for uh, essentially danger to self and others. That's a really high water mark to set your bar on your team. And if it's set way up there, you're going to have problems missing things. However, if you set it really low, you're going to swamp your canoe. If your reporting process is, tell us anything that you're worried about, you're going to get so many reports, it makes the team ineffective. So you're trying to find that safe space in between. Can I add a little bit in there, Brian? Absolutely can. 
So one of the things about using a, a good threat rubric is, is that you're looking for consistency also. Um, it's really important as a bit and care team that, that you are addressing um, um, various um, situations with consistency. And, and if you have a defined rubric um, like dark box and pathways, you can then um, have a consistent way that you address threats. And then if some people come back and say, hey, why did you take these steps? Well, this is the way we've done it with consistency over time. So I just wanted to add that part in there. Yeah, on that. Um, we mentioned this to managers engaging and reflective uh, thinking in this space that you have someone who's able to ask. Uh, we've talked about this in terms of like a 13th person in law enforcement. They use terms like red teaming and penetration testing. Um, the, the basically the person who sits there and says, you know, have we really thought about the broader implications of this or, you know, when we don't do this consistently, what does this do for us? The, the black box thinking is a lot easier in many ways. Uh, this is an old timey picture of Brian uh, snowboarding with my brother and his wife and my wife. Um, I, it was I remember this fondly. Um, I would fall down a lot when I was snowboarding. If anyone's snowboarded before, you know, it's very kind of different than skiing. You're often in a space where you're falling and doing jumps and tricks and things. And, you know, when I was doing this a lot, it was great. My parents had this point where they were like, hey, you seem to fall a lot, Brian. Like I get off the lift and I'd be covered in snow because I'm out in the trees. I'm jumping off things, pulling 180s. Off. And, you know, I had this like moment of wisdom younger in my life where I was like, yeah, when you fall, it's showing that you're trying to do something that you weren't so good at. If you go through this without falling, you're really not learning. You know, and that's important. There's a great video I use um, for teaching applications on YouTube. It's called Life Equals Risk. You can find this, I think, in the chat. It's um, it's another one that kind of highlights the importance of learning from feedback, learning from our failures. So that, I think it's an important way to look at this, that we don't want to um, really have these catastrophes. We don't want to just take chances all the time, but calculated risks can be useful here. Uh, we see this in sports ball analogies. <laughs> we see this with gymnasts, you know, perfecting their routines. If every time a gymnast fell or hit the what is it, the high horse or the or bars they hang on to, my, my knowledge of sports is limited. Um, they, they see these as opportunities to turn differently, to hit things differently, to grasp a pole vaulting pole differently. So they don't see failure as like, oh, I failed, I'm worthless and walk away from it. I think that's an important piece here. Um, same with like post game re review, um, looking at past um, plays, looking at improvements, looking at ways we can uh, do this well. In fact, for for Nina, Dave, and I, when we do trainings, that it can be a slightly painful process. But by watching some of our past trainings, we catch things that we do that might be annoying. Um, that right there is going to have to get edited out. The um, when you're not quite sure what to say and you're transitioning, can be annoying and frustrating. I catch myself doing that. I pay attention to it and then I try to move myself away from it. And that's really only upon reflection. The aircraft industry with black boxes, having a black box not only for the flight data, but also for the radio and the communication and the human piece of these things. I always find it interesting the black boxes are not black. Um, I think that's interesting. This is part of how we look at failure. Two places that do this poorly are courts and hospital. And they see failure here really as a shot at someone's credibility, as some, that we shouldn't fail. If you're a neurosurgeon, you can never make a mistake. And that does create these, what we call fixed systems that aren't willing to grow and improve. Same with the court, a failure becomes a part of vulnerability. So when we think about errors, we can think about casting blame. So the last time something went wrong on a team, someone didn't write the notes down, there wasn't a clear analysis of the rubric, we had a case that never made it to the team, this is a common point of lawsuits, we get into these places where we harshly judge these individuals, and that's not a good place to be. Instead, we want to be in a place, hey, here's our goat, right? We want to avoid scapegoating. You knew a goat was going to appear at some point. And um, in top of avoiding scapegoating, this is another one that the book brings up, is avoiding oversimplification of the problem. This is why we failed. When, when in actuality, it's a multiphasic problem. It's not as simple as this, uh, we didn't use the rubric on this case, because it really gets into, do we have enough time to use a rubric on every case? Should we be using a different rubric that would help us do that more efficiently? Does the rubric lead to clear interventions that we can then check off? So that's where we have this idea. And if you watch that video, Life Equals Risk, 
part of this is promoting um, a, a good visual for success is the Band-Aid, that this shows someone who has tried, who has failed, and is back at it again. Before I talk about what we want to do here, I guess I'll kind of pass again to like Nina and Dave, see if there's some thoughts that they have on this as well. Because I had a thought about failing and getting up and doing it again. Failure uh, versus a mistake, you know, are they different? Uh, is the gravity of a failure heavier than the gravity of a, of a mistake? But I, I really think of it in terms of especially large complex systems um, and drill it down to BITs and people who care for others, you know, six, eight people on a team. If you've not done anything that's going to be um, uh, illegal, criminal, uh, or do harm to a person, it's simply a mistake. And, you know, that can be overcome. It can be rectified. It can be talked about. Um, so if processes don't work. Um, and the the impact doesn't um, land on on uh, the detriment of a person in terms of impacting their life or or harm to them, uh, or it's not criminal or it's not illegal. Now I'm in Nina's area, but um, but if it's not that, it's not catastrophic. Really, it can be it can be fixed. It can be mended, and it might seem uh, painful at the time, like the scrape on the knee and the little kid you put the band aid on and you go back out, uh, but. Uh, the message is don't um, don't become over over invested in in, in um, uh, the gravity of that mistake, but look at it and say how can it be done. And often, it, uh, I think this is brilliant, Brian. What you said it's not one person generally that falls down on a job; it's a systemic approach to training and getting things done properly that fails most times. So that's my minute. <laughs> That, that's all true. I mean, the other thing that it kind of touches on for me is, is thinking about like the, the components of emotional awareness and emotional intelligence, being self-aware to make, you, make sure that you understand. It's the core of everything. It's your ability to look at your own strengths and weaknesses and how you improve that over time, right? As a team, as a bit team that you're involved with or any other team that you're a part of, that you're constantly looking at yourself to see what your strengths and weaknesses are. And I can tell you, my, my weakness is technology. I'm constantly asking Brian and Bethany, hey, how do you do this? So, because that's not my strength, but I know it and I, I address it and I, I hopefully get better every time with it. I think the first time that I did a Zoom meeting for Brian, he was so shocked that I, that I created the meeting. <laughs> so, you know, that's part of emotional intelligence, that and self-management, um, making sure that you have ability to understand and read emotions of others. And, and how you can change that moving forward. Social awareness, how you are able to read a room and say, hey, what's going to apply with this audience? What's the best way that I can reach out to them, right? And finally, the relationship management, how you are able to coach and help others. And that's really why we're here today is to help coach and relate to you and also, you know, get feedback from you and we learn things as well, or do. <laughs> I love that, Nina. I, the, the actual quote, in case people were curious, was, uh, excuse my French, uh, holy shit, did you just send me a Zoom invite? Because <laughs> it blew me away. And Nina, uh, beyond being humble and I think having some grace, knowing what is, you're good at and bad at, like just having the genuineness and the authenticity is a goal I think all of us should aim for in terms of what we're good at and what we need to do some work on. If someone asks you, hey, what are some areas that you need to improve? And you're like, I don't really think there's any. This is exactly what we're talking about in terms of reflective management and leadership that you really should know. And listen, we'll all be on somewhere on that you know, stages of change in terms of how far we're getting along that list of uh, improving and changing and, and making improvements on things. But to at least know where those hot spots are, I think becomes, uh, critical as well. So, so uh, last couple slides here, and then we'll jump into questions. Thanks for your uh, patience as we go through the content. I think it's good stuff. Promoting learning from failure. We want to create a process within the bit, within the college, university, in our friendships, in our community, wherever this applies. Where there is a, and I like this uh, picture a lot because it hits sort of the the play on fair as well as the incentives and tokens. But we want to basically reward people when they do something that helps us improve. Uh, let me tell you a story that uh, my colleague Jeff told me once that I was always impressed with. So one of the things Jeff shared with, um, he had a, a slide template that was up. And when he would go and do presentations, 
that he would tell people at the beginning, if you catch a spelling error or you catch something that's out of place, let me know. And he would keep a collection of like five to $10 Starbucks cards for people and you know would hand them out to them if, if they caught an error. And I thought that was so brilliant in that there was an incentivizing of people who caught a mistake. And, and I know Dean and Dave and I have been teaching long enough, probably Karen as well, to be in scenarios where you're always gonna find something no matter how many eyes look at it. And on top of that, being in a space where you've all probably had someone come up to you after a presentation, and sometimes they're nice and they're like, by the way, I'm an English major and I just, here's this list I made while you were talking of all the things that were wrong. And that is exactly the kind of things that we want to incentivize and encourage. Nina, I'm going to share a story that you're not going to love, I'm sure. The other day, Nina was like, Brian, one of the pictures on the homepage for Deep Rep of you kind of has your eyes closed or squinting. And I, I don't think it puts the best foot forward on you as a presenter. And I'm like, thank you. And I, I really do treasure that she let me know that. And the picture immediately got taken down. And I'm looking for other pictures where I'm opened my eyes a bit more. And, and it's that kind of stuff to not take that personally, but instead to see that as an opportunity um, and this process they talk about, gathering data continually, talking to people about how we can be better, analyzing the errors, you know, is this a good picture or is it a bad picture? How do we fix it? And I love this ad that they have around fixing. Do a tentative fix, see how it goes, and then spread that fix, propagate it, if you will, more broadly through the system. What I hear them talking about here in this is the idea of beta testing. Let's try it out with a small group and really make sure that this works. Uh, you think about COVID. This is why everyone at the beginning was like, here's a vaccine, we really hope it works well. Um, there's a, a amazing Stephen King story and I'm gonna test Bethany's ability to put this into the chat. It was read by uh, Matthew Broderick. I think it was out of four uh, before midnight or something like that. And it was a story where they had cured violence with a certain, they found statistically a group where they were able to find that there was a lower uh, incidence of violence with this group and they found it was tied to the drinking water. So they, they took the drinking water and they put it into everyone's, um, uh, the worldwide into our drinking water. I won't tell you how it ends or anything more than that, but it's a fascinating story and it's also a great audiobook with Matthew Broderick. But it's a good example of where beta testing might be useful. That might be a little spoiler. <laughs> And then we repeat this. So I think we covered some examples. We can do that in the chat. Last stuff here from Dwick. I believe I'm pronouncing that right. She offers this great concept of growth-based communities and fixed communities. A growth-based community is one where failure is intrinsic to learning, becomes a tool for success, and we're encouraging people that we work with and are in the community to take calculated risks. In a fixed or locked community, we say failure really, uh, reveals your inadequacies. It shows us where you're not doing things well. And failure should be avoided because it makes you look foolish or incapable. So if you go back to the earlier slide where failure in courts and hospitals was seen as a negative, I think this is why. We don't want our doctors or lawyers or judges to be seen in a foolish or an incapable manner. So what we want to do is really build these growth-based places where we can move forward. Um, so we'll save the other example for our chat. And I think actually, uh, maybe we'll pause just for a second. Dave, if there's something you wanted to add just based on the last section, and then we'll turn to Nina and then we'll uh, stop the recording. So just uh, any last thoughts on this? Just, you know, uh, and again, less than a minute, it's really just about uh, checking, rechecking and a team doing that, not one person, not the person that's in charge all the time, your, your care team coordinator or your dean uh, or, or the lead person. So it's everybody checking. And then they get the Starbucks card, which I really like if they find something that needs to be changed. Nina. Uh, you know, I, I, I think everything's been been discussed, but I, I think that just making sure that everybody is open to the fact that, you know, we're all vul vulnerable in some way. Everyone is. Everybody has an armor up, but we're also very vulnerable in some way. So just kind of making sure that we understand that you're you know, when, when people are bringing forward information, that might be a little hard to stomach sometimes. But in the end, um, if they're doing it in a kind and compassionate way, in a way for the better good, you realize that it's going to make your team better. And it really is going to make you better as a person. It's going to, it's going to develop some trust within the group to say, you know, I, I'm able to say to Brian, hey, Brian, I, I don't think that picture looks great. I don't think my pictures look great. 
but his eyes were closed in one and it was really hard for me to say it, but I feel comfortable enough with him to be able to, to, you know, impart the information and think that he can receive it in a positive way, which absolutely he did. But it's just something to think about as you work with your team is, is how you go about um, how you approach sharing your information and your, your feelings about some fails and how we can, as a team, grow better from the failure. Did you also uh, Royce Lovett slash Sia to put your armor on in the middle of this too? Because I really appreciate that as well. I think we need like a soundtrack going here. <laughs> All right, let me stop the recording and then we'll uh, get into some conversation.